TED, Technology, Entertainment, and Design, defines why I got into this business. I, my wife dragged me into a used bookstore, and there was a book there talking about disruptive technologies, and the title was interesting, so I started reading it. I was running a family business that I had been running for about 15 years, and uh, it was talking about electric cars, and I never had an interest in cars at all. And, uh, but for some reason, it piqued my interest. So I started investigating electric cars because the rate of growth of technology for electric cars was outpacing that for gasoline-powered vehicles and the whole climate thing and everything. So I started investigating that. And somebody led me to the company out in California that was producing that little blue vehicle that you saw in the uh, foyer there. And design, when I first saw it, I thought, who in their right mind would ever get in one of these things and drive? It looks so ridiculous. And, uh, but then I got in it, and I drove it around, and everybody was my friend. You have people, cameras, cell phones, taking your picture. People just walk up and talk to you. People to open the door and sit in the car. I mean, who, who does that in somebody's normal car? So I thought, you know, this is pretty cool. So uh, we got into the car business. Like Danielle said, I, I was running a business, majority shareholder. I said, you know what? I'm just going to jump and go do this. I used to always thank God that I wasn't in retail and wasn't in, uh, didn't have anything to do with cars. And so here I am. Four problems that uh, electric vehicles address. One of them is oil depletion. When gasoline first hit $3 a gallon back in, what, 2006, Chevron took out full-page ads. Some of you guys may remember them in Time, Newsweek, Business Week, Fortune, Forbes. And they said these kinds of things. It took us 125 years to use the first trillion barrels of oil we'll use the next, 30, the next trillion in 30 years. And then they would say, does that make a difference? Or do you, should you be worried? And then the other one that I thought was interesting said, uh, the world consumes two barrels of oil for every barrel discovered. Well, that was nice for Ex or, uh, Chevron to say. I figured that was just a campaign to justify why gas prices were at three bucks a gallon. But then we looked at uh, International Energy Association put out a chart. You've heard of maybe some of you, the Hubble uh, deple oil depletion. But here it shows that 1960, in the decade of the 1960s, the world found more oil than it's ever found in the past and ever looks like it may ever find again. And you see by this uh, little blue line graph there that that shows how much oil uh, demand is increasing. So obviously when you have decreasing supply and increasing demand, what does that do? Oil prices eventually are going to go up. So electric was the solution. If you look at this chart up here, the uh, blue is what it costs you to run an average car, which it gets around 25 miles per gallon for a year um, at different price points, $1.50, what, $2 and $4 a gallon. The middle was based on the Toyota Prius, which gets about 45 miles to the gallon. So this is your annual fuel cost. Then if you look at a pure electric vehicle like we have out there, you can see even at a buck 50, it's still less expensive to drive um, electric than anything else. Oh, I got a point in here. The Department of Energy. A couple years ago did a study and they said in 20 years, fully 43% of the cars on the road, well, uh, that are being sold will have some sort of electric drive in them. And they said it's because of oil prices, it's because of the oil going down, it's because of climate change. I think they forgot to tell Cleveland because we're supposed to be getting warmer and it seems like it's getting colder, but anyway. The OE says we have a lot of that. The second problem, though, is electric vehicles are very expensive because if you look at these uh, electric vehicles up here, their battery packs cost more than 
Most people pay for a whole car. You can buy a car for nine to $12,000. <coughs> so we were trying to solve that. The solution we came up with, we call it the 70-60 principle. 70 million people commute by themselves every day. The idea for that vehicle out there was by a guy standing on a bridge in Los Angeles and saying, there's all these people in all these cars and they just have one person in that car. Look at all that wasted real estate. So he said, I'm gonna make something to solve that problem. Now, if we were in a poorer nation where you couldn't afford a car, then a little single passenger vehicle like that would be worthless. But we live in a nation where 60% of all households have two or more vehicles. And lastly, if you look at the driving patterns in the United States, assuming those 60% of households, 70% of all travel in the United States is two people or less in the vehicle going 60 miles a day or less. So that gave us this idea back here. Now, until just last year, we were running on your standard lead-acid batteries. Lead-acid batteries, uh, they're great. They give you a lot of power. I raced it against a BMW and up to 25 miles an hour. That little thing was beating the doors off the uh, BMW until the engine kicked in on the BMW. <laughs> <laughs> but they have instant torque, so they're fun to drive. Go seven, that thing goes 75 miles an hour. I'd like to say I drove it here today, but uh, I drove it most days in the winter, but uh, today is just a little bit too bad. Plus, I didn't want to mess up the carpet out there. Um, but with the lithium batteries, we just started with lithium batteries just this last year, and the advantage of lithium batteries over the lead-acid batteries, instead of having to replace your batteries every couple years, as you would have to do in an electric car, these batteries should last 100 25, 150,000 miles, 10 years life, so you should be able to drive forever. So you're just paying that basically two cents a mile to go down the road. Um, so that's the advantage. Now we started off with these at, at under just under $30,000, that's code for $29,995, and uh, now we're down to about $23,000 on our single passenger vehicle. The other solution that we're working on is a two passenger vehicle. Uh, that will get our 60 mile range and fit two people. And so that's the 70%. Now we just need a handful of millions of dollars. People say, well, when will you be out in the market? As soon as I find that handful of millions of dollars. I've already spent one handful, but I just didn't have the second hand. Oops, I'm going the wrong way. Third problem is congestion. If you look at the population of cars right now, there's 650 million cars in the, in the world. They're saying in another 20 years, there'll be 1.4 billion cars in the world. So that's driving some of the demand for oil. But also, where are all those people gonna live? And what is this? 1900, only 25% of the world's population lived in urban areas. They're saying in another 40 years, 75% of all the world's population is going to live in urban areas. And then our roads are going to look <clears throat> like California everywhere. Now, as you look at this, I'm thankful that I don't live in California, but I understand 77 North is pretty bad in the mornings too. How many people do you think is in all those cars? If you look at the statistics, the richer our nation gets, the number of people per vehicle mile driven goes down, and we're somewhere around 1.1 person in a vehicle per mile driven. So when you leave here and you go start driving around, this is one of the things that clicked in my head. Look and count the cars that all just have one person. I was taking my daughter to high school, and we started doing that, and after this, you know, it was always nine or 10 cars that just had one person in them. And my daughter said, uh, quit doing that. <laughs> you already know the answer. If we have all this congestion, where are all these people gonna park? Some places, parking spots go for $35,000 in cities just, just to build them. What if you could put four little vehicles in those, in those parking spots? And then lastly, uh, 
the group that was right before me, they were talking about being made in America. I mean, I don't know how many people I had come and say, look, you need to build your vehicle in China. That's the only way you're going to be able to compete with the, with the car companies. But I just say that it's really not true. We're making this in Ohio. We're actually down in Talmadge, Ohio. And there are tremendous resources in Ohio that can enable us to compete. And by the time you figure out how to put this together, and this is one of the calculations I went through, it costs about $1,500 to ship a vehicle from China over to here. We can make this thing with less than $1,500 in labor. So to me, it just makes sense. What You should make your clothes, make your vehicles, make your stuff in the country where you're living. So those are the people that need to do that. So anyway, some people say, well, how safe is this? Nobody really knew because this is considered a motorcycle until one gentleman in, um, where was he, California, he pulled over to the side of the road because he heard the ambulance coming. And the guy in this Mercedes Benz didn't hear the ambulance coming, or maybe he was texting on his phone, I don't know. And he ran into the back of our parked friend. And uh, you can see almost no damage on the back of our little vehicle. And uh, the BMW, oh, maybe it's a Mercedes. Mercedes, see, I'm not a car guy. <laughs> Anyway, it had, a lot, it had more, a lot more structural damage than, than our vehicle. Uh, our guy drove away, and uh, he said the next morning when he woke up, I mean, he was awake, obviously, but when he woke up the next day, he said he wasn't even sore. Uh, sustainability. If everybody had a car that had 40 miles of, elec of electric, it would cover, and that covers, what, 70 million people commuting back and forth every day. Our nation's electrical system could handle all 84% of all the cars in America being charged up at 110 outlets at night. But now you see some of the major automakers coming out with these 100-mile cars. They want to put four and five passengers in them, which makes them heavier. So now instead of using a little bit of energy, you got to use twice as much energy to go down the road. And oh, you need a two or three thousand dollar charger in your house, but the car company doesn't want to pay for it, the utility company doesn't want to pay for it, and who else is there? And the consumer doesn't want to pay for it, so they want you, the taxpayer, to subsidize putting a charger in there. But if you put too many of these in a neighborhood, the president of uh, PG&E, Pacific Gas and Electric, said it's like charging at 220 for a car is like putting three more houses on the electrical grid. If you have two or three of those in a neighborhood, you're going to have some electrical problems. So, um, you know, I'm sure there'll be solutions to that that they're coming up with, but a nice one or two passenger vehicle that uses just enough energy to get you to where you need to go may just be the answer. Peter Drucker said, the best way to predict the future is to create it. So that's what we're trying to do. Thank you.